Thanks for coming out, you guys. So this is sort of an amalgamation of two different talks, and uh, I probably made it a little too long, so I might go rapido through some parts of it. Um, what I've been doing recently is investigating my grandfather's art uh, more closely in recent times. He was probably one of the better known Native American artists, Choctaw tribe from Oklahoma, <clears throat> the World War II hero, you know, and uh, undoubtedly suffered from PTSD during his life. He died in 1976 um, from abuse of alcohol. So, um, you know, I, I got to know him until I was about 11 years old, but I'm sort of trying to find the cookie crumbs, so to speak, in, in analyzing his artwork, and because a lot of it depicts um, community, joy, abundance, things of this nature. And so um, this is a really early work. Uh, I don't even think he signed it, but it's clearly a peyote ceremony because he was involved in the Native, Native American church. And so when my uncle came around, I grew up here in Southern Cal. Uh, when he came, my uncle came out from Oklahoma, I would always start looking for the peyote buttons around the house and uh, start, I would pocket enough of them. And so I did some experimentation when I was a, a young teen. I would compile enough of them to, you know, to do what was necessary. And he showed me how to clean them and so forth. So um, I had some heritage there. And so uh, having been in the MDMA uh, study, the MDMA assisted psychotherapy, my group was for um, a group, 18 cohorts uh, for uh, treatment of anxiety due to life-threatening illness. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a sec. Next slide, Brad. So if you see his work starts advancing, this is actually a black and white photograph of a color painting. Um, it depicts a stickball game, sort of like a, a lacrosse, it's a Choctaw, uh, Oklahoma version of lacrosse, and apparently it was a pretty rough sport, but this is a nice, clean, tidy uh, depiction of a game of what's going on. And uh, the next one, Brad. And then as the work gets a little bit more advanced, you can see sort of a psychedelic element, sort of a long, wide-angle lens view where the corn is there, it's all bent, you know, and then everyone's engaged in their in their uh, harvest activities or, you know, <coughs> autumn activities and, you know, praying to the sky and, and uh, things of that nature. Is there spaceships up there? It could be. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, you know, enough peyote. But the... Um, <laughs> He really, he really uh, he started getting a specific style, and, and you, you can see the sort of the influence of the medicine in there. The next one. So now there, here's a little bit more. Uh, here's a little later painting, and that's a, again, that's a stickball team just doing their pre-game dance, um, Choctaw stickball. And so um, I kind of got used to seeing these images. Some of the paintings are in my family still. The, he does wood etchings and things like that. And uh, so I just started, I've been looking at these things a little closer to try to get some kind of a story about my heritage and my culture and things of that nature. I do an identify with the culture more now than, than ever, uh, given what I've been through. And so, um, interesting story, and I'll tell, tell it real fast. My sister works in Berkeley. She got a call from a friend who said, uh, my sister's name is Terry. Didn't your, isn't your grandfather named Chief Terry Saul? And that's his name. He, it's not a title. His name was Chief Terry Saul. And uh, she goes, yeah, she goes, I think, and she, her friend was in charge of a estate sale. So she goes, there's an estate sale up here in Oakland. I think there's one of your grandfather's paintings here for sale. And she said, I can't leave work. So she sent my mom, literally a mile, a mile and a half away from the house, uh, reached this estate sale. And there was a painting there. Definitely it was signed by my grandfather. And, um, and it was his work. And so uh, we're kind of arriving at what it might be worth, but it's, I think she paid uh, $300 for it. The woman wanted 600 And that's very low, very, very low for his work. So uh, next, next painting. This is the painting. And it is um, really one of the only dark themes that I've ever seen in his work. And it struck me. I got, it really got something in me. It, 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 um, it's clearly a depiction of an execution scene. So there's a tribal policeman about ready to carry out this execution on this. Accused criminal. I later learned from my uncle that it's actually a, a, a depiction of a, a true story. I haven't got the full story yet, but there, he's trying to he's trying to uh, ferret out the, the real story behind it. But um, I've the paintings at my parents' house, and I'll go up there quarterly or a little more often than that, to, and I'll sit in front of this painting. They haven't framed it yet in the basement, and I've sat in front of this thing for 30 minutes at a time, and just stared at it and, and try to kind of uh, create a story around it. You know, you've got the last meal here, cooking pot of whatever. There's the Husqvarna, the jail where he was, obviously. There's a casket all ready for him. 
And if you look on his chest, there's a, a black spot where um, the uh, executioner, the rifleman, is supposed to aim and hit him in the heart, and, uh, and away he goes. So um, this is also the, the, the uh, good friend of mine pointed this out. This is what they call the Osage roll, the Osage Indians. If they had a, a roll or a little bit of a gut, they would call it the Osage roll. It's because there's a lot of oil on their, on their reservation lands, and they profited pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well from that. But I, I don't know if that's what that is. But there's little details in there to notice. And it's, um, it was, it, the, it, the painting really moves me, you know. And so I, f I finally figured out after staring at it for a long, long time that growing up, you know, believe it or not, I felt a lot like this guy probably feels at the moment, you know, all during the time I grew up. And I thought, hmm, yeah, okay. I get that. I wonder why. And so, you know, I'm involved in this process where I'm looking back into my past and trying to figure out, you know, why things are the way they are, which is very fascinating and interesting and uh, challenging, to say the least. Okay, Brad. Um, in 2012, let's shift gears a little bit. This is a, a, just a piece of art I found on the web that I had to pa take pause because I got struck with this disease called systemic sclerosis. It's also called scleroderma. It's, there's no cure for it. It is life-threatening, and it can kill you quickly, or it can let you live for a few years, or you can live 30 years with it. It's a really cruel and painful disease. Your cells make too much collagen, and so um, your skin will tighten up, and if it gets into your internal systems, which it, I kind of had the type that struck me down very robustly at the in the beginning. And um, I was having heart palpitations, shortness of breath, and got so weak I couldn't even lift myself up off the ground very suddenly. And I was training. I'm, I'm athletic, and I was training at the time for some, some runs. And um, within a week's time, I could barely get up off the couch. And... Um, I, it was clear that something was trying to kill me. It did take four months to get the diagnosis. So I had lived with these symptoms for four months, you know, drink, uh, crunching down prednisone uh, to try to, to mitigate the effects. Um, this painting, to me, depicts what the disease feels like at the outset. You just feel like you're encased in collagen. And, um, you know, if this disease gets into your internal organs and stiffens up your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, you're gone. You know, there's, you can try a T-cell transplant or something of that nature which might kill you, but um, and they have uh, moderate success with those kind of things, but you've got to be on your way out to get that kind of treatment, and it's about a you know, quarter million dollars. So that's 2012, um, and uh, I thought, you know, when I finally did get the diagnosis, and they said, well, I looked at my hands, I was in a rheumatologist's office, and says, um, well, we think you have scleroderma. It's, you're definitely in the right office of rheumatology. I had no idea. I had two pages of things that it could possibly have made from spinal stenosis to fibromyalgia to lupus to, um, you know, also Lyme disease, all sorts of different things. And I didn't have scleroderma on the list because I didn't know what it was. So when I went home and looked it up, oh, and then the, the, the doctor called in the other rheumatologist, and I had two rheumatologists in the room looking at me. And they said, oh, but you look like you have a pretty good attitude. I'm like, oh. It's, so it's one of those, okay, you know, tell me more. And I went home and did the research, and I'm like, I'm screwed, you know. I just, and if I have to feel like this every day for the rest of my life, I'm not sure how long I'll stick around. And the next slide, Brian. That's uh, my hands, sort of. It, they're not much better than that now, quite honestly, but that's hard for me to look at because that's in one of their worst times where the collagen just builds up on the back of the finger and, you get, and your circulation goes really bad. They're, they're quite a bit better. Some of it's due to vasodilators that I take, you know, vitamins and otherwise. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's frustrating. I drop shit all the time, you know, and my hands have poor circulation, so I try to, I try to keep them warm. But they're, uh, I would say my hands are about 5 to 10% better than that, and the good news is the, it, um, the disease in total, I'm probably 90% better now than I was at my worst um, for many, many, many reasons, and none of them have to do anything with, uh, with Western medicine, um, which... I guess to this crowd probably wouldn't be that surprising, but um, next slide, Brad. Um, so I just found this email the other day. It's just the part where I sent it out. Somebody was inquiring how I was doing, 2000, uh, February 2013. And I said, the incessant pain now in the shoulders, esophagus, arches, and that special overall radioactive dog turd feeling is making my mind slip a little. Thanks for the support. It helps. Okay, so um, it, you know, the thing brings, it brings you down. Next one. Okay, I'll read this. This is something I wrote for the MAP Spring 2017 Bulletin. 
and it sort of just gives you a depiction of you know, my typical morning in the worst section of this whole journey. Uh, it's several months before I discovered the MAP sponsored study. I watch yet another capsule of expensive medicine skitter across the floor that, and it escapes under a heavy piece of furniture. I said, I give up. Uh, this has become routine. My disease, systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma, has all but paralyzed my fingers and made them slick as hard plastic. Every morning as I wake, I hope to find that the last 950 days have been a bad dream, but it's never the case. I take 20 minutes to force a decision, get out of bed. I do it. I'm skinnier than the day before, but I feel like I weigh 400 pounds. I feel arthritic, stiff, feverish, like I've got the flu every day. I feel toxic, like I've bathed in pesticide. My skin crawls and burns. My feet and hands pound as the blood forces through the capillaries. My heart skips and slams for a few beats. I'm short of breath. Fatigue drags me toward the floor. My inner voice says, I can't do it. Just let me sleep. I email two clients to reschedule appointments. Uh, so the office will have to stay quiet today. My business is hemorrhaging money. Oh, it's 9.45 a.m., time for a little warm and cozy. I break a 10 milligram Percocet in half and chew it down with a glass of water. I pocket another 10 milligrams for the afternoon. And 10 minutes later, I change my mind and get ready to go into the office. Maybe I'm getting better. I'm fooled by the opiate, but it's doing its job. So went my life and my business for three and a half years, circling the drain. I'll never feel, again, the high of a hard trail run. I won't enjoy my body feeling strong after a week of weightlifting and yoga. I'll never sail my boat again. My friends have stopped the invitations and written me off. It's another 51 degrees day in the Bay Area, but I can't feel my feet. My hands are white. I can't move them. Suicide stops by for a visit. Hey, man, let's go for a walk in the woods. It'll do you some good. So that's the shape I was in when I unfolded the, uh, the Chronicle and saw the article uh, titled Ecstasy Therapy Approved for Trial in Marin County. Um, okay, in the next one. So this is, um, this is actually a later article, but for visual purposes, I circled it and put it up here. Uh, so I did find the trial through an, a notice in the, in, the, in the Chronicle and then followed up. And I was very fortunate to get into that, into that clinical trial, into that study. Next one. Uh, so my group is called MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy for the Treatment of Anxiety Associated with Life-Threatening Illness. It's a phase two off-label data so that hopefully when it becomes legal for prescriptive administration, uh, you know, there will be able, the psychs will be able to write it for off-label use also because there's obviously outside of PTSD quite a number of uses for, for the treatment. Um, okay, next one. Uh, this is some writing I did as I, I gained admission to the study. And I can't tell you how lucky I am. I mean, it, the, the, the treatment saved my life for sure. I would be dead now without it. There's just no doubt. Uh, so I was doing some writing to prepare the, um, my two therapists, Phil Wilson and Julaine Andrews, old school original dispensers of, of, of this type of therapy from way, way back in the day, um, were fantastic. And they, they had me, they set me to work right away just doing some write, lots of writing. And so there's a few things I wrote before I had my first session. They said, chronic, chronic pain chips away at your will. Mental toughness carries you, then your will, then your spirit or something intangible, and then you're tapped out. And uh, knowing how you're gonna die is weird, but it's one less thing to worry about. So this is just some of the prep writing I wrote going into the study. Next one, please. Uh, and then I found this quote at the same time uh, from somebody who had worked in the hospice who said that um, the majority of people who are dying say, I can't believe I wasn't here for most of my life. Obviously, meaning here and like aware of everything and and filled with awareness, and I, and I promised myself when I read that that I wasn't going to suffer the fate of uh, of being in a position where I had to say that if I was on my deathbed, if that makes sense. Next one, please. Um, I'm going to give pay a little tribute to my my therapist, um, Dr. Phil Wilson, Julaine Andrews, Dr. Early. I think I don't know if he's still here, but he's great friends with Phil Wilson. Um, and next one, please. Uh, at my one-year anniversary, I had my follow-up one, uh, one year after the treatment. They took me to dinner, and I took that photo of them across the table. And, of course, in this therapy, as many of you know, you fall in love with your therapist. It's part of the deal. And I'll be in love with them for the rest of my life. You know, Of course, you have to draw boundaries and this and that, but they're quite open. And I've been very, very fortunate to have that, 
that open door policy with them. I can take a problem to them. They're rarely available because they're, I think Jelaine's still involved in phase three. Phil Wilson does his ketamine therapy up in San Anselmo. And they're, they're just wonderful people. Next one. <coughs> and that's a photo of, of Phil and David Nichols and Sasha Shulgin, obviously. Uh, the cool thing to learn is that, um, that I learned was that Phil and Sasha Shulgin were best friends. So as I'm sitting in that room getting this treatment from this molecule, that this guy honed in, you know, um, I would look around the room and see pictures of them together. It was a unique experience, if you could imagine. Okay, next one. Uh, just a quick peek. I'm, not, I'm really cruising through the experience. In my other talk, I talk more about the actual experience going through, not this one. Um, that's the couch where I uh, surrendered into the safety net of love and self-examination. The tripping couch. It's a beautiful room in their house where the study took place. The next one. And that's just a little altar looking out the window toward uh, Marin Headlands that I, I got to enjoy during the therapy. So um, I think the story here is that the container is, is pretty important. The people, obviously, um, you know, the love. And uh, one quick story is I was in the placebo group. So out of five sessions, my first two were placebo, b double blind. So neither the therapist supposedly didn't, you know, have any idea what it was. I certainly didn't. I thought I'd been dosed 100% because I had been withdrawing from the opiates to get in the study. I'd called turkey the opiates to get in the study, and I was still kind of sped from this. So I mistook that speedy feeling. I'd never had MDMA before for having been dosed with, uh, with MDMA. And so I kind of messed up their data because I did really well in the placebo section of the study. And I actually talked to an independent raider during the study, uh, Cody Swift, wonderful East Coast. Um, he's, he's deep into this work. And he interviewed me, and I described this, uh, how I did very well in the, in the placebo section. And he said, that's called the fill effect, because your therapist is that good. And I said, that we, we actually talk, call it the fill effect. <laughs> and so, um, clear, but I, I got to see my curves after the study, and my placebo curve was good, but the curve after the MDMA was, was uh, put into the cup was quite a lot better, obviously. So, next one. Okay, so speeding through, this is... Um, I've got volumes of writing from this time, uh, during and after, before, during and after, um, mostly right after. And so uh, rather than just uh, bombard a talk with a ton of that, I sort of picked the one I thought really boiled it down to the, the bare essence of what I discovered in, in the study. And this is one of them, it's called The Click. And it's really part of what I would got a calling um, at this time. And, uh, and it reads this, something clicks in your brain. It becomes crystal clear that the stakes are this. Death, after a fear-laden and desperate struggle for something ill-defined and unattainable, or death after a life well-lived and having touched the lives of others. So I tried to make it as black and white for myself as possible, and that stuff just came pouring it, whether I was typing it into my phone or writing it down. It just, I would get an emotion that would just pour out of me, and I still have that writing that I'm organizing a little bit more nowadays. Next one, please. Um, and then the integration part, which um, has become a very important topic for me and an important act also to follow through with. Uh, I wrote this um, before I even knew what integration was. I didn't even know the word. I didn't know what would happen. No one told me, you need to integrate after this. Um, this might be, a, I might be foreshadowing a, a later slide, but um, the elephant in the room is that MAPS provides an ethically adequate amount of integration uh, after these studies. So you do get, you know, uh, one week, two week, two month, six month, and one year follow up, but that's that's hardly integration, right? Um, fortunately, my therapist had an open door policy if I needed them. Um, and so uh, I just wrote this down. I said, in the days following the medicine, I've experienced some weight, raw emotions. I'm working with my thoughts with a positive and resolute intention now. A lot can be accomplished here. I'm cashing in on insights, connections, and ideas. I'm writing down thoughts. It feels like the medicine is not finished. And so before I even knew what integration was, I hear I was integrating by writing. Next one, please. And uh, this is just an image. I love this magazine cover. It's, a, uh, I think it's, um, it might be North American Fisherman or some magazine like that. I used to be in the yacht business. I, I used to be a yacht broker. That was my, my, my former career. And I just love this guy's face. In fact, I framed it and gave it to a few friends and I have one myself. And this guy is a Chesapeake oysterman and he, he picks up his oyster traps on his boat with no motor in it, under sail. And he picks up his oyster traps and he's really intense, obviously. But this, this face is 
what it felt like for me to integrate. It was damn hard work, man. <laughs> it really did. And so my analogy um, coming out of the MAP study th that I, I talk about is like, it's like being re repelled down very quickly from a moving helicopter onto a skateboard. You let go of the rope and now you're going 50 miles an hour down a mountain road on a skateboard. <laughs> right away, you know. And, and so uh, while the study saved my life, when you, you know, you, you get out from this treatment and there's just, it creates a lot of work. Okay, next one, please. Um, during the uh, study, I wondered, people kept asking me, how did, you know, your physical symptoms get so much better? Do you really attribute it all to the study? And I go, I just can't, I don't know, you know. During the study, I hadn't, I'd been quite athletic and for four, almost four years, three and a half years, I went from a guy that could do about 70 push-ups to I couldn't do one. You know, by the end of the study, when this picture was taken, I might have been able to do five. Um, and so during the study, I got a, uh, well, one of my friends went to the East Coast and she ran an ultra, ultra race and she sharpied my name, John Saul, on her knuckles and posted it on Facebook and said, you're running with me, buddy. And I said, wow, because I used to, you know, running was a big part of my life and I hadn't done anything. Yoga, weightlifting, nothing. I couldn't move. I hadn't done anything for four years. My athleticism was just, just canceled. And so during the study, I thought, after uh, my friend Shauna did this, I said, I'm going to get a pair of running shoes and see what happens. I got a pair of running shoes, and this is taken right after my first one and a half mile, like, trot jog down the Marin Headlands Trail. Um, and it, was, it hurt. It was painful. It felt awful. I thought, I, I don't know if I can ever get back in shape. But I did it, you know. And uh, I got the tiny rush of endorphin afterwards, and I took this photo of me flipping off my, my shoe, my new shoe. <laughs> Because um, it hurt. It was, it was a very painful run, but it was a turning point that it, um, blossomed and it, it, my body just thanked me and said more, 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 more. And I just got back into the athletic scene and lifting weights, doing yoga, um, running a lot. And uh, that's a big part. And I got the courage because I was under those eye shades and I got that message from the medicine to please, you know, try this out. Go ahead. Next one. Um, and there's another piece at endpoint that I wrote, um, or maybe that was a few weeks out or a month out. So when you get your internal house in order, you learn to entertain only the truth in your thoughts, and you learn the medicinal value of crying, learn to tap into the gigantic pool of empathy that exists to balance the loneliness and fear and anger of the human condition, your life changes for the better. This is what I was starting to find. Next one, please. Um, I might just, I'm not going to totally skip this. Intention is a different uh, topic that, I, that I, I, I talk about, but these assignments that we get sometimes in any of these psychedelic experiences, you know, bring up these questions that we have to sort of address, you know, big ones. When do we change our career? How do we install a meditation practice? When do we redefine a relationship? When do we dive deep inside? When do we make friends with our body? When do we open up and share our story in community? And uh, what I found is um, most of my cohorts, I've had a chance to meet a handful of them. I actually got a chance to meet most of my group, 18 people. Uh, a lot of them put this experience in a little box with a bow on it, a tidy little box on the mantle, and just say that was a great experience in my life. It, was, you know, it did a lot for me. Um, and then that's it. You know, we don't discuss it, don't integrate, we just keep it private. You know, those therapists belong to me, that room's mine. You know, it's sort of this, it's, it's, uh, it happens. And so I'm a big proponent in one of my soapboxes is get your story out whether it's just family and friends, that's community. Get it out into public, or whether you go bigger, you know, like, like doing this. Next one, please. Um, so I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. Uh, these are, this is just a punch list of stuff I use to get better. There's a litany of stuff. The number one important thing is community and integration. This is community. What I'm doing right now, thank you very much, is integrating. And um, music, meditation, yoga, like meditation, actually do it. <laughs> yoga, you can get deep in, as you know, probably. Um, exercise a little too much is good for me. I like to push it a little too far and then get knocked on my ass and sleep for a couple of days rather than not do enough. If I don't do enough exercise, I, I suffer. Uh, nutrition, sleep hygiene, Satan's final exam. I have trouble with sleep, so I'm, I'm struggling with it all the time. Next one. Um, so on this one, I emphasize get right to the truth in every matter, gently. Um, continuing education, of course, psychedelics done well. Um, down here, uh, mirror, oh, make micro choices when the going is hard. I think that micro choice thing came to me from a mushroom experience subsequent to the study. 
but it was, um, if you just, the only thing I can say about it is if you just increase your awareness to little forks in the road that happen d during your day, whether it's a thought process or, or an act or just a way of thinking or a way of reacting, um, if you just increase your awareness, you'll just notice these little forks in the road. It's just a micro choice. It's just a little tiny choice that's not, not totally heavy, not hard to make. And it's just uh, a little adjustment in the thought process at that moment you have a chance to make a micro choice. It's very attainable, very achievable, and it makes huge, huge difference uh, in, in the outcome is what I've, what I've found. Um, let's see, okay, next one. Uh, humor, human interaction, human touch, make friends with your body, psychedelic local community, volunteer. Uh, okay, that's it, uh, next one, please. Um, so, as integration is such an important topic to me, um, I'll tell you just a quick story. Uh, the heritage of the three-peer integration support call. It's one of the things that I do now. Um, is it started with one of my cohorts, she's Allison. She's given me per permission to use her first name because she's not entirely public. But um, we uh, met each other at a fundraiser for MAPS in Oakland in two April 2000, or um, what was it, 2016? A April 2016, I believe, one year before psychedelic science. And there was a fundraiser there. Uh, I spoke, did a little five minute piece and it uh, completely terrified. And I met her, and she was right out of the study. I think she, she might have been one of the last people out of phase two. And it was like, wow, a co you've been through the study? Yeah, we never meet. Okay, so we started this conversation, and then her therapist uh, diligently swept her away, ushered her away, because, um, I, well, it, it's just as a protection mechanism. She was just right, right out of the study. And uh, we were about to probably have a three-hour conversation. But it wasn't before we had exchanged contact information. So. Every Sunday we started talking on the phone and integrating. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just helping each other out of the ditch because it was rough. And she was having a rough time as well, rougher than I was actually. And so every Sunday it turned from one to two, sometimes three-hour conversations on Sundays. And we helped each other through some really, really hard, hard things. And um, over time uh, we met Rachel, who's here tonight. And Rachel joined our, our kind of our, our powwow on Sundays. And... Um, I said, you know, I just thought to myself, I'd like to really create a MAPS group where we meet on Skype and have these conversations and we help each other. And the thing is, MAPS can't help us get into contact, or they couldn't. They were not allowed to give out contact information or help us in any way meet our cards. We have to meet them by accident at an event or just through word of mouth. And so we thought that was just kind of sad. And so my hope for doing Skype calls on Sundays um, with, with people coming out of the MAPS study was sort of... Um, you know, water was thrown on it. So um, what happened was people started kind of coming forward out from their own independent therapy. I like to, I like to work away from the word underground, but people doing their own self-examination and psychedelic therapy started joining the calls. And we started doing it on a regular basis and it sort of got legs and we just do these calls now twice a week. And I think the only uh, limitation, there is no limit. There, there is no limit. I mean, I'll, you know, I just have to make friends with some people, and I, I'm going to have more than I can handle. So this, this, um, it's sort of be is becoming this thing, getting great feedback. Uh, we already talked about the elephant in the room. That's the ethically adequate amount of integration that MAPS provides. Um, and no MAPS cohort available for the calls. Next one. And so this is just sort of a, <laughs> a cartoon of what we do. There's four faces there. You know, that's uh, probably the call manager or call. I call call facilitator now in the upper left. And the call facilitator, which is me right now, participates as a fully equal participant in the call. And we observe ground rules, okay? But we allow emotions, we encourage emotions, and there's some extraordinary things that I've learned and witnessed on these calls. It's, um, there's no uh, psychiatric diagnostics going on. There's no, we, we try to avoid uh, uh, coaching and a direct advice. Um, but it's a, it's a really great venue for, for people to integrate and express, and people will, make remarkable gains right in front of my eyes, and I thought, how did I end up here? It's, it's, it's remarkable. Next slide, please. And so um, the currency participants bring to the peer support and integration calls is experience, understanding, a common bond, and the will to feel better. We all just want to feel better because we think better, we operate better in life, we put out a better vibe. We just need to feel better, and that's physical or not. Um, and the magic is in the ground rules. So the ground rules are obviously address anonymity, full anonymity, uh, holding, holding space for your, your cohort as they express, or your, your participant as they, they express themselves, uh, peer, your peer. Um, uh, obviously, legalities, safety, 
Um, what am I missing, Rachel? Do you have uh, anything? Confidentiality. Confidentiality is the main thing, mm -hmm. holding space. And then we encourage friendships to be made outside because Allison and I became great friends. And that friendship um, the, was tremendously helpful, it is, is tremendously helpful to this day. And so uh, if people want to make friends, they route their request through the, the call facilitator and I'll try to connect people and people have made friends. Uh, and, and it's quite a good support network. And so next one, please. Um, I have a foundation, I'm, I'm 501c3 pending, map to remission. And uh, it, it, uh, it's going to be a foundation. I think one of the things I'd like to do is scholarships for people who can't afford ketamine treatment or MDMA facilitated psychotherapy when it becomes legal. Um, uh, technology, I have some technology things on the, on, the, on the burner that are gonna help people who are getting knocked on their ass by life-threatening disease can wrap their head around what's the big picture and what's going on. And then one of the armatures here is, would obviously be the three peer integration and support uh, from that. Okay, next one, please. And so uh, the implications for the future, and we're about to split off a couple of groups now is um, the, the original dream was an all MAPS integration group and the good news is that the door is cracked open now and MAPS is allowing us in, in, uh, to contact, or no, for cohorts to contact us. It has to be a one-way valve. So MAPS can provide our contact information and people coming out of the what we call MP16 study, which is a phase two on paper, bridge study between phase two and phase three. It's between 30 and 45 uh, participants that just ended, um, uh, we're going to have notif you know, notices go out and they're going to have access to us and we're going to be able to have calls with people coming out of the MAPS service. It'll be an all MAPS group. And we're, we're hoping that we can, they'll also retroactively contact phase two participants and we can get a phase two group or combine them. And uh, hopefully they'll, let, they'll have us doing it for phase three as well. So it's just a wonderful piece of news that happened recently. Um, so groups for chronic pain, autoimmune disease, so getting out of the psychedelic realm, uh, combat veterans, childhood sexual abuse, all women's groups, uh, depression and bipolar, cancer, first responders, addiction recovery, and the ground rules are a template. You just take the psychedelic part out, and those are a great template for these other groups to, to happen, and people will get the benefit of a small, intimate version of community, which is, it just happens to be, I think, a really good size. Um, I think we made it through. How, what's next? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thanks.